2004, he's worked at McMaster University as the chair for scholarship in the public interest. And he's been recognized by a number of uh, bodies as one of the, the top educational thinkers of our time. He's a noted author. He's written and co-authored 62 books. I just get tired thinking of it. And countless articles. He has an interest in neoliberalism and its effect on our society. And his topic today is neoliberal violence in the age of Orwellian nightmares. I present Henry Dr. Henry Dewey. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Good, good. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. This sounds awfully loud, but I'm assuming it's, it's all right. Yeah, all right. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to do today is I want to try to understand and articulate what I think are the forces that are very different that your generation is facing as compared to the forces that my generation faced. And it, and it seems to me that one starting point is really with George Orwell. Because Orwell, in, some, in, in a sense, had an understanding of the forces that in the mid-50s or the 30s and the 40s were bearing down on democracy in a way that he felt really could undo not just simply the ideal of democracy, but the fact of democracy. And I think we find ourselves in an era in which those kinds of anti-democratic forces are once again at work. And it seems to me they're at work in a way that is far more perilous and far more dangerous than much of what we have seen since the end of the Cold War. So my talk is basically going to be about that. It's going to be about what I call these different registers of violence, whether we're talking about the militarization of local police, or we're talking about what's happening in Ferguson, or we're talking about popular culture, and how these things now come together to create a kind of metric of violence that in some way speaks a great deal, I would think, to the very nature of the society, the societies that we live in, particularly those that are under the reign of what I call neoliberalism, and I'll talk about that, or market fundamentalism, or what I call casino capitalism, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We'll, we'll be, you know, try to bring that all together. So let me begin. It seems to me that central to George Orwell's nightmarish vision of a totalitarian society was a government so powerful that it not only dominated all of the major institutions in a society, but also it was quite adept at making invisible the workings of power. And this is what some have called a shadow government, or a deep state, or what I call casino or neoliberal capitalism. Under the reign of neoliberal capitalism, casino capitalism, politics becomes the domain of the ultra-wealthy, the elite who run powerful financial services, big corporations, the imperious leaders of the defense industries, and other components of the military-industrial complex. For example, corporate interests such as ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies, mega banks such as the Bank of America, and defense industries such as Boeing, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Northrop Grumman, and Lockheed Martin are powerful lobbying groups that control the major seats of political power. They also control the commanding institutions to ensure, necessary to ensure that the deeply anti-democratic state, state governs in the interest of, of the few while essentially exploiting and repressing the many. Put differently, Casino, under casino capitalism, the house always wins. This was recently made clear by a Princeton University scientific study that analyzed policies passed by the US government from 1981 to 2002, and discovered that the vast majority of such policies had nothing at all to do with the needs and the voiced interest of the American people. And this is really not too far, I also think, from, from of course, Canadian society. And as the authors pointed out, the preferences of the average American appear to have only been minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant, had a, a statistically non-significant impact on public policy. Put bluntly, the study made clear that the opi opinions of the public per se simply didn't count. That study concluded that rather than being a democracy, the United States had become an oligarchy where power is effectively wielded, quote, by the rich, the well-connected, and the politically powerful. 
as well as particularly well-placed individuals in institutions like the banking and the financial industries. Increasingly, Americans and Canadians live in a neoliberal market-driven society in which people often participate willingly in their own oppression, mostly because of, the deep of a deep insecurity about their freedom and their future. This is a mode of governance in which individual or social agency are in crisis and begin to disappear in a society in which 99% of the public, especially young people, low-income groups, and minorities of class and color are considered disposable. We live at a time when politics is nation-based and power is global. That is, the financial elite now float above and beyond borders and no longer care about the social contract and they make no concessions in their pursuits of power. This is very interesting. This is an important concept because it seems to be that what I'm saying here is unlike in the past, power is global. Politics is local. Politics is rooted in the nation state. But power is, is obli somewhat oblivious to the nation state. It doesn't care. So it doesn't make political concessions anymore. In the 1950s and the 1960s, there was a relationship between capital and labor in which capital said, look, we have to make workers happy because if we don't, they'll revolt or they won't come to work or they'll slow down the production process. They'll stop the machine. Well, when power is global, what they say is, screw you, we'll go to Mexico. We'll go to, we'll go to, go to the south of China. We'll go to the Pacific Rim. We don't care about you. So what you have is the emergence of a kind of market-driven society in which questions of compassion, questions of justice, the social contract in general is now vilified. It's ripped open. It doesn't matter anymore. So you have emerging these financial elites who in many ways are sort of, how, how might we say this, so grounded in their, their own self-interest that what they create is basically not only a massive culture of exploitation and inequality, but a culture of cruelty. A culture of cruelty that in many ways sees any form of dependency as a, as a liability. Any compassion for the poor as a liability. Any notion of reaching out and doing something for others becomes an object of disdain. And in many cases, what we see in that culture are, are endless scenarios in which if somebody is poor, or somebody is homeless, if somebody doesn't have a job, or somebody is unemployed, they're not just simply not an object of compassion, they're actually an object of scorn, an object of disdain. As if they're responsible for what they do, because central, to, it seems to me, to any neoliberal logic is the assumption that whatever problems that you face are your problems. You're responsible for them. So what that means is that we abstract questions of prob the problems that we have, we reduce them to a kind of notion of individual responsibility. We, we individualize the social. The larger social political context, it disappears. Questions of class, questions of power, questions of inequality, all of a sudden evaporate. I mean, let me give you the classic scenario. And you've all seen this. You know, you're watching a television program in which somebody has lost NBC, CBS, CBC, somebody's lost their house, because of the subprime crisis, right? And it, inevitably, a, a, a man and a woman, young, older, are being mostly young, being poor minorities, low income, being interviewed, and the male or female starts crying. And in this case, I'll, I'll focus on the male. He starts crying and he says something like, uh, I don't feel like a, a, a man anymore. I feel like I, you know, I've, lost, I've lost the ability to take care of my family. And so he blames himself. So, you think, wait a minute, what's wrong with this script? What's wrong with this script is that the banks failed them because they sold them a subprime mortgage. They cheated and they lied. They knew he couldn't finance the house in the beginning, but they told him to borrow anyways. This is not about, uh, this is not about shaming a person who all of a sudden is about to lose his house. This is about recognizing you have a system that's rigged in the interest of the rich, that's rigged in the interest of the wealthy, that's rigged in the interest of the financial elite. But all of a sudden, when, you're, when you find yourself in a position where you can't translate private issues to public considerations, the public collapses into the private, and all you have are questions of character. So you say, people who are homeless are homeless because they really don't want to live in a house. 
You know, people are unemployed because they don't want to, they're too lazy to fill out the employment application. People are poor because they like being poor. And it goes on and on. Young people living with their parents. They're just living with their parents because they like their parents. <laughs> you know, not, not because they don't have jobs. You know, not because the system is crumbling under the weight of inequality that makes it very difficult to produce jobs and all the wealth is being concentrated in the upper 10%. When 400 families, for instance, in the United States own as much as half the entire population. 400 families. So it, it, it seems to me that when these issues all of a sudden disappear, we're trapped. We're trapped because the only language that we can fall back on is either therapeutic or private. I blame myself, I need therapy. I need to go see my therapist, you know. I need to, you know, I need to find my, get my head in the right position and somehow fi find myself. You know, you all know the script. The script on the neoliberalism is clear. And it goes something like this. It says, A, it says that we, we need to dismantle the welfare state. The welfare state is just a burden. It just doesn't belong anywhere. The last thing we need to do is to provide the elderly, the weak, the sick, the poor, or the population in general with health care. We don't need to do that. Let them fend for themselves. We don't need the welfare state because the welfare state basically doesn't benefit, it only benefits members of the working class, people who are suffering. But actually it benefits everyone because the healthier a society is, the more democratic it tends to be. And then there's the question of whether or not you want to create a society in which the basis for agency is as such that people don't have to worry about being caught up in the logic of survival every day. Think about it. You know, when I was your age and I was in college, I worked three jobs. Time for me was a burden, not a luxury. Because I had to work and study at the same time. That was hard. But I meet kids at McMaster University for whom time is a luxury. They don't work at all. They just go to class. And that's good. Every student should have that opportunity. Because education in Canada and the United States should be completely free. Should be completely free, with no question. Because education is too central to what it means to create a democratic society, to turn it over to private interests, or to let people believe that it's an entitlement rather than a right. Now, you can sit back and you can think, well, that's part of the welfare state, right? Yes, it is. Thank God. And that's exactly what it should be. And why should it be free? Because, for instance, in the United States, it costs $65 million to provide tuition and other costs to enable students to go to school for free. We spend on one F-35 jet in the course of 10 years producing a, a trillion dollars, and they can't fly in the rain. <laughs> They can't fly in the rain. And what am I saying? All I'm saying is, it's not a question of whether governments have the money. It's a question of how they want to appropriate the money they have. You want to appropriate it for a war machine? For wars in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and elsewhere? That's fine. But let's be honest about that. Let's say we would care more about the warfare state than we do about investing in young people. Let's not say young people are simply too lazy to go to school or young people really don't care. And I must tell you, we do have a welfare state. But it's very different from the welfare state that you hear about. It's a state that in fact provides uh, all kinds of sub subsidies for the rich. It's a state that eliminates corporate taxes. The Bank of America in 2012 made over a billion dollars in profits and got a rebate. They paid no taxes, they got a rebate. So it seems to me that the way in which neoliberalism, these market-driven societies, the way in which they take language and turn it upside down is something that's Orwellian and something we need to be attentive to. Secondly, it seems to me, under the, under the neoliberal, under casino capitalism, the only obligation of citizenship is consumerism. Think about that. Remember George Bush? Do you remember him? <laughs> How could you not, right? A recurring nightmare. George Bush after 9-11 gets up and says, in the face of a tragedy beyond one's comprehension, go shopping. Go shopping? Really? I mean, or why not examine American foreign policy? 
Well, why not ask ourselves how do we put this tragedy in a larger context? Or what does it mean to create a more a peaceful, democratic world? No, go shopping. And it seems to me that when we buy into that logic, I mean, not only do we devalue the notion of citizenship itself, we have no way of understanding what it means to be a real agent. You know, what it means to use our capacities and our intelligence, our emotions, our moods, who we are as individuals in ways that benefit the larger public good. Because we have no language for the public good. Your generation, unlike my generation, we had, we, the language of social democracy was everywhere when I was a kid. Unions talked about getting rights. Teachers were valued. Public school teachers were valued. People talked about social justice. People talked about community. People talked about, you know, in, in a sense, modes of solidarity, working together. In the neighborhood I grew up in, it was impossible to imagine any kid defining him or herself as being isolated and alone and just existing in that mode. You had to connect with other people. You couldn't get by in that neighborhood without doing that. You couldn't get by. It was impossible. Modes of solidarity were what defined who we are. For your generation, modes of solidarity were almost extinct because you don't even have a language anymore for talking about community, except on the internet. You don't even have a language for talking about social justice. And I don't mean you. I mean the society in general. Because what it's done is banish that language. It's banished it, or it's undermined it, or it's devalued it. The other side of this, another element, of course, that we all know about, is that we need to invest in prisons rather than schools, rather than tra public transit. All of our funds now move away. There's a massive redistribution going on in Canadian and American and neoliberal societies. And that redistribution is the movement of wealth away from the public sector into the private sector. And when we say moved away from the public to the private sector, that means it moves into the hands of relatively few people and out of the hands of a great many people. So in that distribution, there's a kind of massive sort of stealing going on. We also find ourselves in a society in which it's often said that, market, that the only values that matter are exchange values. The only form of exchange that matters is organized around commerce. That money and its accumulation is the ultimate measure of, it, of in the way in which we define not simply the good life, but societies in general. And I think that when you take all these together, what you get basically is the return of what we might call the New Gilded Age. Some of you know what this is and some of you don't. In the 19th century, you had an age when big business ruled almost everything. When women were in their place, African Americans, blacks were in their place, minorities were in their place, labor was exploited. And that led eventually right to the Great Depression. And then there were reforms put into place, particularly in the United States, later in Canada, that seemed to address the issue of what might it mean to provide protections for people? What might it mean to provide social provisions so that people wouldn't labor under time as a burden? They wouldn't have to worry about surviving in a sense, and nothing more. And your generation, what's so tragic about your generation, is think about the ways in which your sense of agency is being constrained. And I'll give you just one example of a kind of violence on the material and symbolic level that you all know about. Think about debt. Debt, to me, is a new form of indentured or indebted citizenship. And what it means is that in Canada, the average student graduates with a, with a, a debt, a student loan debt, of $37,000. In the United States, it's $33,000. And what that means is not simply that you owe money, but you owe time. You owe part of your life. And that means you owe part of your life in ways that now direct your life into categories, and into choices that you probably would not have had to make. For instance, you won't take a public service job. You'll take a job in the private sector that pays more so you can pay back your debt. Secondly, you'll take a job where you've got to be very careful about what you say because the thought of losing your job and not paying your debt is in some way a risk that you might not want to take. Thirdly, it's an attack on the radical imagination. Meaning that when you're in debt and you're there and you're working just to survive, you barely have time to think about anything else. 
And for me, I really believe that the debt structure in Canada and the United States is not just simply about disempowering you by virtue of forcing you to endlessly think about what it means to never have a house, you know, to think endlessly about a job. You're going to have 30 bosses or something like 25 bosses in your lifetime, allegedly. But to all of a sudden find yourself in a world of such a financial and physical uncertainty that it becomes difficult to imagine a future other than the one in which you live in. So if, if you can't think otherwise, you can't think otherwise, it becomes difficult to act otherwise. But when you're burdened by the logic and the demands of survival and nothing more, the imagination crumbles. It disintegrates. It doesn't work. It doesn't become a basis by which you can imagine a different life and collectively work for, with others to actually fight for that life. It becomes Disney-esque, a perverted notion of Disney. Oh, we all live on Main Street, everything's fine. I don't want to think about what the problems are. And for working class kids, it's worse. Because the, the, all the research now indicates that rather than becoming political, they become depoliticized. The working class kids are now saying, I don't care about politics, I just want to get by. You know, there's nothing else for me to do. I just want to do everything I can. Now, couple this with another register of violence. And it goes like this. My argument is that as the welfare state crumbles, that, that part of society that provides provisions, that part of society that says, hey, look, we want to create a set of conditions that will enable you to develop your capacities in the best way possible so you can be engaged and critical agents. As that part of society crumbles, something happens. Another part of society emerges. And I want to call that the punishing state. And the punishing state works through a whole range of registers, of which I'll talk about. One of those registers is increasingly it criminalizes social problems. So that when a woman goes to a hospital and there are drugs in her system, we don't call a doctor in and say, hey, look, how can we deal with this in a way that will save her life, put her back on her feet, on her feet give her a chance to really sort of live in a vibrant, healthy society or environment, we say call the police. Or when we find homeless people on the street, we don't say, this is tragic. Nobody should be homeless in a rich society. Nobody should be homeless anywhere, but particularly in a rich society. So we arrest them because they're violating certain codes. Or take a look at your schools. Schools are really interesting because they've become models of what I call punishment creep. Meaning that the prison, and as a model for social relations, that model creeps out and begins to touch other institutions. It's, it, it begins to define the nature of other institutions so that when you walk into certain schools, particularly in low-income areas, right, they don't look like schools. And they don't act like schools. They act like, they, laugh, they act like prisons. You have metal detectives. You have guards everywhere. You know, you have kids being punished under zero tolerance policies in which if they violate a dress code, they're put in handcuffs, put in the back of a police car, particularly in the United States, and, and booked. And all of a sudden you have parents who have no money who now have to bail these kids out, and if they fail, and they don't pay back, they don't pay the fines that are often levied against them, they go to jail. That's a system that begins to eat its own children. That's a system that in criminalizing social behaviors, basically becomes as close to a totalitarian state as you can imagine. That's what happens when, in fact, the question of what it means to prioritize social justice over punishment becomes a priority in any given society. And it seems to me match that with what we now see going on in the United States. On November 22nd of this year, a 12-year-old African-American boy was shot to death because a cop confronted him and he had a BB gun in his hand. 12 years old. Trayvon Martin killed because his body was in the wrong place at the wrong time and he was an African-American. 
Michael Brown, with his hands up, shot, and the cop, as you well know, has now been absolved of any charges. One could say, well, this is what happens in complex societies where you have lots of inequality, where in fact, uh, you know, there's an increasingly attempt to resort to punitive measures rather than to solve social problems. But what happens when a society becomes so militarized that certain elements of that society are rendered war zones. If you get a chance, Google CNN, the documentary Blue and White, Blue, Blue and Black, and watch it. And it, it, it starts off with a very disturbing image. It starts off with an image of a black man who is confronted, a rather large, African-American man who's confronted because the police believe that he's selling cigarettes illegally. Selling cigarettes. This is a really major crime, right? They then put him in a chokehold and while he's on the ground claiming I can't breathe, he dies. Nobody, nobody's charged. Picture that next to Ferguson and all the images that we have seen of police forces that looked like SWAT teams. In a post 9-11 world, what has happened is the weapons of Iraq, the weapons of Afghanistan, the weapons from, from various wars that the United States has engaged in have now been turned over to police departments. So instead of police negotiating with communities and in some way trying to find a space to be able to develop a sense of trust, possibility, and reform, and to deal with the problems that they're facing, the police now are so overly militarized, they look like they're out of a Mad Max movie on speed. Guns, you know, vests, the helmets. I mean, it doesn't exactly promote a sense of trust <laughs> when you're walking home from school. You know? Oh, there's Officer Joey. Hey, look, you know, Oh, that's a tank behind him. Oh, good. Yeah. And he's got, a, he's, he's got a submachine gun on his side. <laughs> you know, hello. When you, when, you, when you watch, the, when you listen to the narratives of African Americans in, in the United States, and they say things like, the mothers especially, say things like, I'm worried about my kid walking home from school because he's 17. He's a black, young black man, and he has to walk three blocks. And I'm thinking, okay, the next line is going to be is, well, they're gangs. He's crossing into bad territory. He's in trouble. And they say, no, we're afraid of the police. We're afraid that the police basically is going to attack him. We're afraid that those institutions that are supposed to protect and serve us have now been transformed into war machines. Who, are you ready? Act with impunity. Act with impunity. That's the mark of a society that's gone insane. That's the mark of a society that is post-Orwellian. That's the mark of a society that believes that all social problems will get worse, and the only way to deal with those problems is basically to punish the people who experience them. Couple that with Orwell's image in 1984 of that television screen, Big Brother, right? And you know, you wake up in the morning and you wave, hi, Big Brother, <laughs> how are you? Oh yeah, I'm going to the bathroom now, I'll be all right. And we think, and some of you who have read that in high school or other places, you think, wow, how could we ever? That's a, this is fiction, you know? We, we could never find ourselves in a society where fiction all of a sudden becomes reality, where reality makes fiction look bad. <laughs> where it makes fiction look second rate, something weak and silly and has, makes no sense. <clears throat> the television screen is outdated. It's gone. Now they have ways of turning on your computer uh, in your home uh, so that they can actually watch you without the little camera light coming on. They can track every place you go by virtue of your GPS phone. If you're worried, take the battery out and put it in the freezer. They, have, they are reading all of your emails and all of your electronic communications. They're storing it forever. 
in storage bins in Colorado and other places that <clears throat> can hold more in metadata than you and I could possibly imagine. And the people who expose those crimes are called criminals. Edward Snowden, a criminal. Uh, George Bush, a hero. Henry Kissinger, recipient of the Nobel Prize, even though he bombed half of Cambodia into oblivion. Barack Obama, Barack Obama, the great hope, who instituted something called the, Na the National Authorization Act, which means that he can kill any American citizen he wants at any time without due process. They actually have a kill list that they put together. They meet, I believe as the New York Times pointed out, once a month, and they decide who they want to you know, eliminate. Or you can talk about the Military Commissions Act, where you go before a court and there's no, you have no lawyer. Or you can talk about being put into indefinite detention, because you look like a terrorist. <laughs> We're going to, yeah, there you are. We're going to put you in a ship offshore somewhere. See you in five years. These are not just simply simple, civil violations. These, this is not simply about a surveillance state. This is about a new form of authoritarianism with a smile. It has a smile, because here's where Huxley comes in. All this Huxley went the other route. If Orwell said repression is visible, it's about the boot on your neck, it's about surveillance, it's about the rise of the military industrial complex, Orwell said, no, it's really about Disney. It's a participatory form of totalitarianism. Happy totalitarianism. We feed you soma, nonsense. We feed it to you in the popular culture. We feed it to you, you know, in the amusement parks. We feed it to you in the films. And it makes you quiet. It makes you happy. Happy entertainment. We feed it through you to the Kardashian sisters. <laughs> we publish a book called Selfish by Kardashian that has, thank God, 2,000 selfies in it. Can't wait. We go out buy it tomorrow. <laughs> and I guess the real question is, how is it that idiocy can be so organized, so produced, so distributed, and so legitimated that it's barely noticed as a form of public pedagogy rather than as a form of entertainment? That its purpose is not under any circumstances to entertain you, it's to quiet you. <laughs> to make you silly. It's to reduce the possibility for intellectual thought and critical analysis. It's to shrink the capacity to be a real agent, to be in the world, to care about something, to believe that citizenship is not the only obligation, that consumerism is not the only obligation of citizenship, that social justice matters, and that you can never, no society will survive if you really believe it only consists of individuals organized entirely around their own self-interest. The thing that's so scary now about the new technologies and the way in which they have been taken over by the Canadian government with its own surveillance system, or the United States with its own surveillance system, is how these technologies now operate within a, a void of public values. So when you turn on Facebook, you don't get, okay, hey, look, Check this out around inequality. Or check this out around the way in which schools are being privatized. Or check this out around what it means to in some way organize to help people in the community who are homeless. What you get is, I just picked up my baby and uh, take a look. What you get is an endless stream of utterly privatized nonsense. That's what you get. Because the discourse has been so narrow that it becomes impossible to imagine these new technologies as a way in which you can become politically empowered. And of course, we have, we have exceptions to this. We saw it in Iran. We see it in China. You know, we see it in other countries. And we see it in Canada and the United States. But it's very limited in terms of its scope and in terms of its influence. So, so the question becomes, how can you imagine acting otherwise by thinking otherwise? What would we have to do? How can we set up some sort of discourse, some sort of sense of what it means to be empowered? What does it mean not to be so paralyzed by cynicism or so paralyzed by the kind of privatized existence in which we live that it becomes possible to imagine not simply a different world, but a world in which people would mobilize collectively together in order to make that world possible? 
And it seems to me there are four things that I'm going to talk about. And now I'm going to end. I want to avoid it. And I, and, I, and I think that the first thing that we need to understand is, all of us, is how do we resuscitate what we call the radical imagination? How do we do that? How do we imagine what it would mean to live in a real democracy as opposed to a country that is authoritarian yet makes a claim to be a democracy? How do we imagine what it would mean for people to have ownership over the basic forces that control their lives? What would it mean to have a social state, a social state, a state that's concerned about the social, every, the, the fate of everyone, in ways that would not eliminate the market, but would limit it? Would limit its perilous sort of interventions into polluting the atmosphere, exploiting people, amassing massive amounts of income and inequality, that short circuit and eat away at the very fabric of democracy? How do we imagine what it would mean to be involved in institutions where, since we have a stake in those institutions because they control our lives, we should have some power over controlling them? What does it mean to learn how to govern rather than simply be governed? What does it mean to be an individual and social agent rather than somebody else's agent? How does that work? And it seems to me these are questions that have to be grappled with because they're questions that allow us to break through a moment in history when public, critical, and historical memory is evaporating. Nobody looks back and says, hey look, we had movements in Canada and the United States in the 20s and 30s and 40s in which people actually struggled together. They fought against forces of domination in ways that somewhat provide both a sense of inspiration, in some cases maybe a model, but are capable of energizing us. Nobody talks about the Black Panther Party and what it did for communities. It didn't just end up in California you know, brandishing guns. It also provided health care. It also found ways to meet people's needs. And the first law, it seems to me, of a radical imagination is simple. How do you make something meaningful to make it critical, to make it transformative? You got it? Meaningful. How does it connect to people's lives? How do you then problematize it so that it becomes a kind of mode of critical inquiry that allows you to break through common sense, that allows you to put things in a larger context? My argument would be that the death of the radical imagination is rooted in a new understanding of how knowledge works. And it goes like this. This oppressive mode of knowledge, this pedagogy of oppression, it begins with a fact, and it goes no place else. It doesn't put the fact in a larger historical context. It doesn't put it in a historical set of relations. It doesn't com uh, compare it to other issues. It isolates. Oh, there's, there's, there's an environmental hazard at work now. Okay, that's it. You know, everybody should do their part, right? We should all pick up, we should all pick up waste. We should all recycle. But the fact of the matter is, the environmental monster that we now have to face the destruction of the environment, it's not about simply us doing our individual part alone and in private. It's about massive corporations that are polluting the earth. So you can't understand what it means to talk about environmental justice unless you understand what it means to talk about political economy. You can't do it. It makes no sense. Just as you can't talk about schools being so bad that kids are not learning, they don't have the proper resources, and then what are we going to do? I know, we'll hold charity balls. We'll ask parents to contribute money you know, to somehow make sure that teachers have at least the most elementary of resources. That's meaningless because what we are seeing is we're seeing a disinvestment away from public funds and public schools into what? Into charter schools, into private schools. Or we're seeing tax corporations that, uh, that governments refuse to tax that now eliminate public funds. So there's no money. That's about neoliberalism. That's about hypercapitalism. That's about a system that doesn't care about public schools. So you have to understand one, you have to understand the other. If you really want to understand how the United States has a mass incarceration system with 2.3 million people incarcerated and over 7 million people under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system, then you have to understand something about the rise of the punishing state. 
So it seems to me that on, 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 the, on, on, on the measure of this, how do we talk about a radical imagination, we have to be analytically relational. We have to think in terms of wider relations. Secondly, it seems to me, we have to be able to understand what the forces are that are at work that are ruining a democracy. The first rule of an oppressive politics is to make power invisible. It makes it invisible. You don't know its workings. And then it shrouds it in common sense so that you don't really have to question it. Oh, everybody, you know, you know, how do we say this? I mean, un unemployment is like normal, right? Uh, inequality is normal, right? Societies are flooded with goods that are stupid and cheap and just, you know, undermine the environment. That's normal, right? That's called the normalization of domination, meaning that social relations get enacted over and over again in a way in which they no longer become questioned. Secondly, it seems to be you don't need just a language of critique, you need a language of hope. You need a language. It's not enough to simply say, oh, this is what's wrong with Canadian and American societies. You need to be able to inspire and energize people to believe that they in some way can make a difference. They can think otherwise in order to, again, act otherwise. That's what matters. We don't want to, in a sense, so over-describe the notion of domination that we can't imagine that power has no other relationship or mode of intervention. Power is not just on the side of intervention, it's also on the side of resistance. Feel as you, as you might about what's going on in Ferguson or across the country over Michael Brown. What you really are seeing is a language by those who often don't have the opportunity to resist to speak in their own voices. You know, Martin Luther King once said, he said, what, you, what they term riots, in some cases, are really is the language of the oppressed, manifesting itself for the first time in a way that gives it an opportunity to say, that's enough. We've had enough. And there are few opportunities for us to be able to say that, and unfortunately, in some cases, it goes that route. Secondly, it seems to me, we need to understand something about the nature of education. Meaning that I don't think that when we talk about education, I'm just talking, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not just talking about schooling. I'm talking about what does it mean to create alternative modes of education and to reclaim public and higher education in ways that enable people to learn things that are critical, that are insightful, that are thoughtful, that enable them to engage in critical dialogue, that enable them to learn narratives that often are being excised from schools today. I'll, I'll give you an example. In Florida, under the potentially next president of the United States, that amazing intellectual, Jeb Bush, <laughs> he, his legislature passed a bill in Florida claiming that history teachers could not teach history by interpreting it. That they had to simply present the facts. I know. Think about that one. Last thing we want to do is, you know, put history in a context in which it becomes problematized. Last thing that we want to do is talk about race relations in a way, or the history of lynching, or civil, the civil rights movement, or the women's movement, or the gay rights movement, in a way that might raise disturbing questions about a history that's often white and only committed by isolated white men. Remember the, the, the Bertolt Brecht poem? Did Napoleon really cross over the Rubicon alone? Or into Europe alone? Really? Did labor unions not exist in ways that pushed FDR to implement the New Deal? I mean, what you see here is an erasure of history. And it seems to me that education has to be reclaimed so as to at least provide those oppositional voices and knowledge that enable us in some way to rewrite the discourse of history in ways that benefit us. Secondly, it seems to me that one of the things that I have seen with people on the left is they never take education seriously. Meaning that they don't realize that for people to act, you have to change their consciousness. Unless you change their consciousness, people are not going to act. And, they, and actually, they may participate willingly in their own oppression. Oh, the police are really wonderful. You know, they're great. And, you know, when I come home from school, they, they give me a ride to my house. And this kind of nonsense, right? 
and, and, it, and it seems to me, unless we can focus on the educative nature of politics itself, meaning that education is not marginal to politics, it's central to politics. You have to change the way people think. You have to do things that are meaningful to make them critical, to make them transformative. And to do that, you have to understand something about the very nature of education itself. It's no longer primarily about schools like this. It's about the educational nature of the culture. The culture is a giant educational apparatus. And you see it in multiple cultural apparatuses, from the media, the mainstream media, to the to alternative media, to websites, to screen cultures, to Hollywood films. And the media, it seems to me, once that's controlled, where you have five, six corporations in the United States controlling the entirety of the media, five or six corporations. That's why we get films, you know, in which vi extreme violence now is so over the top that you get the impression that the only way the American public can be energized anymore is by violent films. That they, that's the only way they can possibly feel. The, the country has been so deadened that we have to resort to extreme violence to up the pleasure quotient, to make it realizable, to make it work. But it seems to me, around the language of hope, the question for your generation is, how are you going to use those new technologies? How are you going to create alternative public spheres in which your voices can be heard? How are you going to create spaces where alternative narratives are going to be produced? Let me tell you something. Noam Chomsky is a friend, and he's 10 years older than I am. <clears throat> I won't tell you how old he is. <laughs> 10 years ago, you, you, you would have to really search to find Chomsky's voice anywhere because he certainly wasn't being published in the New York Times, and he certainly wasn't being published by, by, by uh, mainstream uh, book, book uh, publishers. Now his voice is everywhere, because you have an alternative media that's opened up that publishes him, that publishes Chris Hedges, places like, and you should go to these sites, places like Counterpunch, places like TruthOut.org, places like TruthDig.org, places like Alternet, places like Common Dreams, these are, these are sites of resistance. These are places where new forms of knowledge are being created, where young people are actually not just learning how to read text, you should be learning how to produce text. It's not enough for you to read a text critically. You have to learn the mechanisms of those apparatuses so you can produce your own radio shows, your own TV shows, your own elements of screen culture. Because if you don't do it, you're going to be unemployed. And the, the dominant media will not use you if they think you're dangerous. So it seems to me that education, in a sense, becomes absolutely crucial as a way to think about what it might mean to, in, in, in some way, envision alternative public spheres. Finally, it seems to me there's the question of how your generation is going to reject a political system that's fixed. It's fixed. Do you really think that democracy is simply ultimately measured by electoral politics? So you vote for, for you know, you, you vote for Disney, Walt Disney, or you vote for, I don't know, the guy from Mad Magazine. You vote for Obama, or you vote for, for, for Bush. What's the difference? What? That much? What, it should be that much? That you have to fight for new political formations. You need to fight for third parties. You need to fight for parties that are not within the logic of the existing parameters of what politics and power are all about. Because you need to develop organizations. It's not enough to demonstrate. Demonstrations are fine, but that's like a quick love affair. That comes and goes. What you really need are long-term organizations. You need to be. You need. You need uh, tactics. You know, you need financing. You need to build organizations that basically cut across a whole range of borders. They need to be global. But more importantly, you need, or as important, you need a comprehensive view of politics and a, and a comprehensive vision. You know, look, the left and progressives, Canada, the United States, across the world, have, been, have lost in many ways because they're too fragmented. You know, you're about race and nothing else. You're about working class justice and nothing else. You're about women's rights and nothing else. You're about gay rights and nothing else. It doesn't work. 
Those movements are crucial and they're important and they open up spaces that matter. But they can't be the end of what it means to develop a politics that's comprehensive that brings these groups together into larger, broader social movements. And how do we end this? Demand the impossible. Thank you.